Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, in this presentation, I want to talk about the uh, laser polishing of 3D printed uh, plastic components. And uh, to start off uh, with a small introduction, uh, I want to briefly mention uh, currently popular uh, surface finishing methods for 3D parts. Uh, you probably know most of them, if not all, like evaporatory grinding. Uh, manual grinding polishing is also quite uh, common uh, for the 3D printing of plastic parts. Uh, chemical etching, sandblasting, painting uh, are also common. Now, now they are commonly used, uh, but some of them or all of them have typical deficits. Um, I want to talk about a few of them, like um, some of them might introduce foreign particles uh, into the surface that might have to be cleaned afterwards. Uh, others have uh, rather low reduction in roughness, uh, especially sandblasting, for example. Others have higher costs, especially in manual, um, pro uh, manual processes, or they might change slightly the geometry with edge rounding or have low selectivity like the uh, vibratory grinding. Now, um, those are typical deficits, not all processes have all of them, obviously, uh, but um, that's the reason why we want to in develop a new post process um, that might be able to solve some or all of the uh, deficits, and that's the laser polishing. Because it's probably not known to everyone, uh, I want to explain the process principle because this is quite different from um, classical approaches. So we have our uh, laser source um, coming um, from, from, from the top here in this sketch uh, onto the material surface. Then it's absorbed in a thin layer on, at the surface, heats up this uh, thin layer uh, up until it melts. And uh, in this melted state, the surface roughness can sort of flow out uh, through the surface tension. Now the sketch is rather um, uh, applied for metals because here you have a sharp transition um, between a liquid phase and the solid phase. For glasses and plastics, this transition is not that sharp, obviously, but the uh, process principle is still the same. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a few examples where this um, technology is already used um, for glass materials, uh, primary for optic manufacturing, um, also metals and plastics um, are possible to, to um, polish with this technology. Um, today I only want to talk about plastics, of course, um, and I want to briefly explain how the uh, process strategy is for, for those uh, parts. Now for plastic components, we typically use a CO2 laser uh, because with its uh, 10.6 micrometer wavelengths, it's uh, absorbed very near the surface. Um, and then we guide this laser beam into a galvanometer scanner. There are two mirrors that can move the laser spot across a surface. Um, the movement of this um, scanning strategy looks like this. So we have our laser spot um, that's moved in a bidirectional way across the surface. And actually the uh, whole polished area um, is processed at once. So we scan across this polished area with a very high scanning velocity, uh, high track distance, and also a defocused laser beam to um, get to to heat up the whole polished area uh, as homogeneously as possible and at once. Now, if we would use uh, simply a constant laser power, uh, we would heat up the surface more and more. So we need some kind of control mechanism. And what we do is measuring the uh, surface temperature with a pyrometer. And then we have a closed loop control that consults the laser power to keep the surface temperature of the polished area at a constant level. And with this, we um, reduce the process to its two main uh, process parameters, um, sorry, which are the process temperature and then the, the polishing time, basically. That's the time, how long you keep the melt pool 
um, yeah, hold this mate pool at the surface. Now to verify how homogeneous the temperature actually is, uh, we can look at the uh, actual measurement of the pyrometer. Uh, you can see here on the uh, graph in the red line here is the set point temperature. So this should be the polishing temperature. In black, you can see the measured temperature at, of, of the surface. And uh, you can see after a short heat up phase, the uh, temperature control kicks in and controls the laser power here in blue uh, to keep the actual temperature at the surface at a constant level. And this can be hold now for an arbitrary amount of time as long as it's needed to reduce the surface roughness. On the right hand side, uh, I have a short video of a thermographical camera where you can see uh, in the first few seconds this heat up phase and after this heat up phase the temperature distribution uh, in this case in a 10 by 10 millimeter field size uh, is rather homogeneous and actually it, it is uh, similar to um, a temperature distribution that you wouldn't, would achieve if you would use a top hat intensity distribution of your laser source uh, and that's why we call this uh, quasi top hat uh, strategy. Now, um, this simplification of the process leads to a very simple experimental um, design uh, because you only have two main process parameters, temperature and time. Uh, so you can set up an experimental design to get the influence uh, of temperature and time on the resulting surface roughness. And on the right hand side, you can see the example for an uh, SLS printed PA12 sample. Uh, the initial roughness was about 16 micrometer. Uh, I, I show it on the next slide in more detail. Um, but you can see from this graph here on the x-axis uh, the temperature and the y-axis shows the interaction time, polishing time. Uh, and you can simply see a few things. Uh, if the temperature is too small, obviously the melting temperature is not reached and nothing happens. Uh, if the temperature is too high, then, well, a thermal degradation can occur. Uh, in this case, for this material, a colorization occurs. Uh, so that's not the desired uh, parameter range. But then you have your uh, desired parameter range, in this case at 210 degrees, and uh, for 200 seconds interaction times, uh, you get the lowest roughness here. Obviously from this graph, uh, it's easy to interpret that for longer interaction times, uh, the roughness is even further reduced, uh, which is actually the case, but not included in this graph here. Um, and now this was all a little bit uh, theoretical. Uh, now I want to show an actual picture of such a surface. Uh, you can see here on the left-hand side, um, a 20 by 20 millimeter test field on an SLS printed PA12 sample. Um, and in the center here, you can see a white light interferometer measurement of the initial state. So after the printing, before laser polishing, uh, there we have a roughness of about 16 micrometers, uh, typical for 3D printing. Um, and after the laser polishing, well, on this scale, the surface basically flat, uh, the uh, left roughness in, the, in this case about 0.3 micrometers, so far below one micrometer, which is most of the time uh, some kind of goal um, point. Now that I uh, talked about the process principle and showed an example um, where we want to polish or we want to use the laser polishing uh, for typical 3D printing materials and then the first question, uh, question rising is uh, which materials can actually be laser polished and um, that's quite e easy to answer. Um, the general requirement is that the material has to be thermoplastic because it needs a melted melting state. Uh, but that's basically all of the requirements. Some might need a drying step before the polishing uh, to avoid bubble formation or something. Um, but then with this uh, shown quasi top head scanning strategy, uh, you can easily find a suitable parameter set um, 
that at least um, yeah, shows the processability of a new material. And here at the bottom, uh, you can see a few materials that we already tested. Um, most of them are 3D printed with either SLS or FDM uh, technology. And on the right hand side, um, you can see a few examples of um, surfaces here, TPU, polypropylene and uh, peak. Uh, now the roughness values here, uh, I have to mention this, are measured in a one by one uh, millimeter area in the center of the test field. Um, now the next question uh, after we have a material that is uh, processable is uh, of course which geometries can actually be laser polished. And um, I want to split this into four categories or four types of geometries um, starting with a simple small two-dimensional area. Um, with this quasi topaz strategy uh, we can simply apply this onto the surface um, even if it has a um, different shape than the, the square that I showed before, uh, because of the scanning strategy, we can actually make arbitrary shapes um, of the resulting melting pool, basically. Um, so, so that's the easy case, uh, just a stationary polishing. Um, now, we, if we want to go to larger areas, um, so this starts at around 30 by 30 millimeters typically. Uh, then we come to the limit of the stationary process and we have to um, move this quasi top head field with, for example, a mechanical axis across the area. Um, this might look like this. So we have here in the dark orange uh, color the, this quasi top head field and uh, move this across the larger area um, with a certain uh, feed velocity um, to polish a larger area. Now, because of the scanning of the quasi top head uh, field, uh, we can also uh, change the sh shape of the quasi top head field to uh, consider uh, slight changes in geometry or changes in, um, in, in the processed uh, area. Now, the next step would be uh, what we call uh, 2.5 dimensional structures. Um, this is basically a 2D uh, structure with the height profile. Um, this actually doesn't need much adjustment of the laser process. As you can see in the following picture here on the left hand side, um, so curvatures of 30 or 30, uh, 20 or 30 degrees um, can actually be processed without a significant adjustment of the process. Um, but then, of course, we're talking about actual 3D printing. Um, if we have a real 3D part, we need some kind of uh, rotation or pro part handling system, like a 5D, a 5D axis system or something uh, to rotate the um, part. Um, so every side of the part can be accessed by the uh, laser. Now, this has one limitation. Uh, this is important to mention, though, uh, hidden areas where the laser spot can't reach the surface of the material cannot be processed. Okay, here on the right hand side, you see a few examples uh, of uh, peak um, material. Okay, now I want to briefly summarize uh, what uh, I talked about. So I presented a new approach for the 3D printing uh, surface or the, the surface finish of 3D printed parts, which is laser polishing. And uh, this brings uh, some really good advantages. Um, the first one is that the um, process is completely contactless and it is non-abrasive. So it's a remelting of the surface and you don't actually remove surface material. Uh, this has also the advantage that it might be able to uh, close pores from the um, rather porous, uh, rather high porosity of the surface. And because we use a laser, uh, we have a 100% a digital and completely automatable process, which really well fits into the idea of the digital manufacturing 
um, or industry 4.0 and you know all these buzzwords. Um, the limitation is that we have to have some plastic materials. Um, but here the advantage is uh, SLS parts or FDM parts, for example, they are always uh, some plastic materials. Um, the roughness reduction is uh, typically a factor of at least 20, sometimes even a factor of 100. Uh, so a roughness below one micrometer um, is commonly used, in some cases even uh, 0.1 micrometer. Um, but I have to say this uh, is a research or this, this process is in a research state and there's actually not an uh, industrial application yet, but this brings me to the outlook uh, in the near future, the next step would be applying this process to an actual business case or an actual use case for a real 3D part. Um, also, what's uh, surely always interesting is looking at the combination of different process, uh, processes um, and maybe integrate the laser polishing into an already existing uh, process chain to further reduce uh, roughness, reduce polishing times or finishing times uh, and so on. Okay, well, that's it for me uh, and thank you very much for your attention.